Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, Art Talk Session 1. We have today Evan Amundsen, who was kind enough to come and talk to us today. Um, up, hey, guys. Yep. Um, so, Evan, uh, I guess uh, the best place to start is uh, what, what began your journey into art? Well, that's a good question. Uh, well, I kind of like when, when you're like 15, 16 in Norway, you get to sort of specialize your high school experience to you know go into some sort of study. So I already like drawing. I mean, I, I drew quite a bit before that as well, but that's kind of when I decided I wanted to do something like that. And then uh, I got like my, my best friend at the time. He was really good at drawing. So it was, I think it's fair to say that jealousy kind of drove it in the beginning. Because he was better than me, and I wanted to fucking be better than him. So that's kind of how it, how that began, in many ways. And then there's sort of the whole passion and and, uh, and getting into it and finding that there were you know things to be done in that that uh, kind of drove it onwards. Did you have uh, an ongoing competition between I the guess, two? Yes. I mean, it, it it kind of becomes we, we kind of sort of veered off into different disciplines. He's a tattoo artist now, and I do uh, concept art. So we don't do the same thing, but we do. I mean, yeah. As as with any best friend, like you, you, it's always going to be a competition. <laughs> <laughs> did you uh, go to art school, or did you just was it all self study? Uh, I I did go to art school uh, in Norway uh, after high school, so um, for two years. Uh, but whether or not you could call that like legitimate study, I don't know, because um, like. Apart from the, the life drawing was good, and we had a really good life drawing teacher, so, so that's like legitimate study. But uh, a lot of what you study in those kinds of art school is essentially self-study because they essentially just give you a, a space to study in and then go <laughs> go crazy, do what you want. So, so there was a lot of self-study, and then I made the classic mistake of sort of carrying on that that course of, uh, of study by going into uh, university for illustration for one year, and then realized that that was expensive. It was all hell, and so I got the hell out of there. And uh, <laughs> tried my hand at freelancing, and then I got a job at uh, the wonderful Volta Studios in Quebec. Nice. So Did you that... want to tell us about your experience there? Yeah. Uh, well, like, okay. So, so just after I'm, I had, uh, sort of foolhardily, um, foolhardy, yes, um, quit my uh, university career. I uh, sort of started throwing around for, you know, what do you do now? You really don't want mom to be right about that whole, maybe you should go into maths sort of thing. So <laughs> I, um, I had the good fortune of having a friend of mine who had sort of seen the, the studio in Quebec, of all places, was looking for artists. And he was like, yeah, you could at least try and apply. Um, so, you know, lack of anything better to do, I, uh, I wrote them probably like four times until I got through the spam filter and uh, uh, managed to sort of uh, get them to let me do the art test um, over the summer. Uh, and so for two months, I locked myself away in my uh, uh, my friend's studio, who has this wonderful studio out in buttfuck nowhere in Norway, and uh, basically just worked my ass off and uh, did the art test. And um, I think the third happiest day of my life was when they wrote back and said, like, yeah, yeah, it's approved. You can come over. And uh, oh, wow. that was that was pretty crazy because that's that's one of those like moments of vindication where you go like yes, <laughs> suck it, world. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that that's kind of where where that started. So the yeah the the experience at at, at studio was really good at least for the first. I was there for three years. Uh, the first two years were amazing. Like I I really really enjoyed it. I had some kick ass artists. Like uh, I don't know. You guys know who Ruan Gia is? Ruan Gia. Yeah, that sounds really familiar. Like, I, I don't know him like, personally. Like, I, I probably have seen his work, though. Okay, so uh, for, for the audience, anyway, like, Google Ruan Gia and Yun Ling and Adi Salman and Anna Fair. And there was, like, a ton of heroes who were there. Um, and I got to work with them. And it's one of those things, like, well, the first time you get into a studio and there are people there whose work you've followed for a while, you're able to go, like, when, when you're feeling a little low on. Um, on inspiration, and you can just go to the other end of the studio and just watch them work a little bit, and you're like, "Holy shite!" Yeah. Back to work. Got to get better. In the in the in the immortal words of uh, Espen Satovich, "Got to get better." You know. So that was amazing. And then 
there is a moment when they ask you for advice when you sort of suddenly go, holy crap, that's awesome. <laughs> so that is a great experience. Um, and that was a great experience. And I also got to work with this guy, um, Arnaud Feu, who, um, who is also like an amazing artist. And we, uh, we got to work w with each other like directly a lot. And so getting to know how to work with another art artist directly is also a very, very nice piece of experience that I got to, got to have. So that was, a, that was a really good three years. Uh, but as with any job, you know, like the, mm. the honeymoon period ends, and so you kind of move on. I think this is actually a really, you bring up a really good question, is that, uh, like, a lot of people, like, I mean, I, I used to have the same mentality where you, like, you sit in a room all the time and you're going to say, I'm going to study until I'm good enough to go get in a studio or whatever. But then when you can actually, like, when you feel like you can actually start taking work, uh, I've heard that, like, actually just going ahead and taking the work and working alongside other professionals, like, pushes you faster. Like, because you have competition there in the studio with you, it's like it makes you better. Yeah, I mean, it's very. I mean, Brad Rigney, for example, is the is the prime example of like the opposite of that. That dude just like sat down in his ba basement for years until he got like crazy good. And I think you know there's something to be said for that, like mm -hmm. developing your own aesthetic and really sort of just focusing on like exactly what you think is cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know that that will work for everyone. Uh, and so you kind of just have to get to know your own limitations on that and figure out. What, I mean, that sounds so fucking hippie, but. Some um, people, I think, need that almost kind of like militant regiment, you know, like to make it feel like an obligation. Some people just, I think, um, don't have the self-discipline to like sit down and do it themselves. Some people, I think, need to work alongside other people for the yeah. 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 yeah, that's um, that, that is essentially right. It's just trying to put it in a way that doesn't sound like it's all different for everyone, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but I think um, in the end, it kind of, I think the appreciation that this isn't the job that you're getting into. This is a whole lifestyle thing. So you have to treat it as such. You have to treat it with the seriousness that what you're trying to get into here is something that other people have dedicated their lives to. So, you know, not to get too high and mighty on people, but you're going to have to treat it that way if you want to become good enough to get into the, the jobs that you probably want if you set out on this in the first place. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's something uh, over the last year I've come to realize, like putting in like a lot of <laughs> eight and ten hour days just pumping out stuff trying to get there. Yeah, that is that is just intense. And I think I think, I think taking take, taking pride and taking happiness out of out of, out of what can be conceived as failures, I think, is also important. Like knowing that even even when shit isn't going exactly how you want it to, that means you can still learn from it. You can still take stuff out of it and then come back and do it differently next time. And even when stuff isn't working out correctly, that is still progress. That is still, you know, a step in the right direction because you can learn by elimination. So yeah, that uh, whole mi that whole mindset of just continuous effort towards improvement, I think, is what people generally have to drive into their own minds, at least in the, in the beginning. I yeah, totally agree. Like, oh, sorry, Paul. I was just saying it's the difference between like doing it, doing a piece and being like, oh, this sucks. I'm just not in the mode today. Ripping it up and throwing it away, and then just looking at it and saying, okay, what is wrong with this picture? You know, like is uh, yeah. you know, what is it that I did wrong? Let's do it again and let's see if I can make that right. You know, so rather than and you don't even have to do the same image. Just do keep that aspect in mind that you messed up on, and then you'll start to. It's like. It's almost like riding a bike. You know, you get on, it's a little wobbly at first, and then it starts to flow, you know, the further you get down the road. Yeah, yeah. it's like being a kid, I think. You know, you can't be afraid to fall. Like, when you're a kid, you just get back up. I think adults, like, as they get older, like, they're almost afraid of failure, but failure is necessary for the learning process. Yeah, and I think I also had this, I had this talk with, uh, with a person who was doing studies and sort of just didn't understand what they were supposed to be learning from these studies, and... When I looked at the studies, they were essentially just like direct copies of the reference, and they hadn't gone and sort of analyzed what they were doing. It was just like continuously copying stuff and hoping to learn from it. And I think that's, I don't know if that's like a trend with people, but it I, I kind of shocked me that they didn't know what studying as opposed to copying was, and that a study needs to be an analytical, I mean, you have to deconstruct what you're seeing, analyze right. it, and then reconstruct it, which is how you essentially create your own style, because then you use mark making as um, a sort of an engine to create a study that you like the aesthetics of. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Oh, definitely. No, I completely agree. Like, I, I think, um, like, a lot of people, 
are, are just not introduced to the fundamentals the right way early on, and I think they get in a habit of just mimicking, you know, just copying what they see, but they don't understand how to sort of break things down into basic forms and really kind of practice the perspective and all this information that you need to, to be able to deconstruct these images and actually take information from it. Because if you're just mindlessly copying, then, you know, you're, you're not actually learning. Exactly. Okay. So, yeah, that, that, that was the long-winded answer to how was your experience at Volta. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry guys, if I uh, glitched out there for a second, my internet's been my internet's been wonky all day. Uh, what did we uh, leave off with here? I uh, he just went over his first uh, studio experience. So uh, what what happened after that? Uh, well, at the end of um, my third year, I kind of felt like getting back to freelancing and sort of like trying to rediscover a little bit of. Uh, what got me into the whole thing in the first place, because it can get really intense when you're at a studio, and so you kind of, it's easy to get to a point where you kind of lose contact with, with that, like, personal sense of cool or whatever. So um, I moved to, uh, for, from Quebec to uh, Prague, where a bunch of my uh, earlier co-workers had settled, uh, and Prague is a great, I mean, if, you, if you're in Europe and you want to go freelancing and you're not sure that you will be able to make the money, um, I would suggest Prague. Prague is a kick-ass city because it's uh, it's very cheap uh, for what it is. It's very high um, the, like standard of living, um, and just artistically, it's a beautiful city. It's got tons of history, and it is also the former home of Alphonse Mucha. So at least until the end of this year, it is the home of the Slav Epic uh, collection, which is uh, sort of what Mucha did when he. Uh, did sort of work for himself rather than the uh, commercial stuff that we pretty much all know him for. So yeah, like if you want to go freelancing, I suggest <laughs> Prague. It's in my... So while you're freelancing, you mentioned that you were also trying to kind of get back in touch with what you loved about it. Was there any personal projects or anything that you did for yourself, art-wise? Yeah, like um, I... <laughs> I found myself reading the Harry Potter books again, and so I <laughs> reflected that I was really annoyed that there was no uh, Scandinavian school of magic. Even though I know some Harry Potter fans have pointed it out to me that Durmstrang is supposed to be Scandinavian, but uh, it does not have that feel to it. So I kind of wanted to make a school that sort of was more in tune with the uh, with the, the sort of saga nature of Scandinavian culture. So I started doing like the, my idea for like you know, for teachers. For the school, that was uh, a lot of fun, <laughs> and it became sort of uh, a little project I could do between freelance work, and got a little bit of attention for it. And I still mm -hmm. do. I still have one more uh, teacher I want to do before I put that uh, project to rest. You ever plan on maybe like trying to do like a like a, a bigger scale kind of thing, like maybe like a graphic novel or uh, you know uh, maybe doing your own work in some comics or something? It's like I mean, I've heard that like uh, um, a lot of people that like you know do freelance and work in like studios for a while. They eventually are like, you know, uh, now I'm, I'm just working for myself for somebody else. It would be nice for me to just work for myself. Yeah, like in the long run, I, I mean, I would love to be able to like create a like personal IP or something, and then just do a bunch of that, or or find a client that I can develop an IP with, like get it get in early. Like, if you guys know Paul Bonner, for example. Yeah, Paul Bonner. Yeah, like he, <clears throat> he's been sort of in with uh, a couple of uh, these miniature studios for a long while, and so like his his style is very much bound up in, or th their work, their their IP is very much bound up in his style. So he has a very free hand in, in sort of developing and developing their IPs along with them. So it kind of becomes his his brainchild as much as theirs. <laughs> so that is like that is a very ideal situation. I'd love that, or you know something along those lines, that'd be great. Uh, I think something that is, uh, um, I'm going to ask a question that's going to be, it's going to be a, uh, I guess it's going to be a shot in the dark even for you, because it's like, you know, would you, re like, if maybe you could go back and, like, say, okay, I could go ahead and, like, develop, like, a long-term, like, personal IP or something now, and you could build it, like, while you were getting good or something or whatever, like, would you recommend already working on like an IP and trying to step into the industry that way, or waiting until later? 
It depends. I think people tend to get a little precious with their ideas early on, and so like they get a really good idea, and they want that to be the be-all, end-all of ideas. Uh, and I think that is shooting yourself in the foot, because as long as you're learning, you're always going to be getting better. So I, I would rather just do things and have done them, and then get the experience, and then go on to something else and, and do it again and do it again, because <clears throat> I don't think that, like, the, the core idea of any given IP is usually not what makes it genius. It's the treatment of that idea. So yeah, I mean, if, if you want to become a good pro problem solver, then give yourself um, you know, specific problems and try and solve them in creative ways. I think mm. maybe taking on an entire IP early on could be very daunting and kind of more work than people can really deal with in terms of uh, in, in terms of like problem solving. And especially when you're just getting started, I usually suggest people uh, take take on very specific problems and then solve them. Um, as individual uh, smaller problems rather than like taking on uh, entire batches of problems like that. But sure, like if, if you're getting to uh, like an intermediary point and you, you want a bigger challenge to do beside work, for example, then yeah, like create your own IP. Try and come up with an idea. It doesn't need to, need to be like the most genius idea ever, just something that kind of appeals to you. And then take it as far as you can be bothered and then see where it takes you, see what you learn, and then then make another one and another one. Like I have a bunch of ideas that I play around with all the time, uh, and <clears throat> when I find the time, I'll probably sit down and start start developing another one. Mm -hmm. Hey, Coley, yeah. oh, you can make sure you're yeah, still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you just got hired from Blizzard, which yeah. uh, congratulations. <laughs> uh, how how was uh, like how did you go about um, pursuing that position? Oh, that was <laughs> that's a it's a great question, but it's a, I'm I'm afraid I'm gonna have a very useless answer because I didn't. Um, I had the great luck of uh, in December this year, uh, I was sent an email by the called, uh, guy called Doug Alexander, who is uh, who is a uh, he's head of the cinematics department at. Blizzard, and he essentially just wrote me and said that they had seen my portfolio and they thought it was pretty neat and asked if I would like to come and work for them, um, which freaked me out because it was a very sort of bare bones email. It didn't, I mean, you know, when if you ever get like an email from a big studio, you kind of expect it to be in like a big logo and it'll say like exactly what position they are, and you know, it, this didn't say anything like that. It just said, you know, hey, we find your portfolio pretty cool, would like to come work for us. Done. That's all it said. So, casual. <laughs> I, was, I, I was pretty sure that this was bullshit, to be honest. Um, so I started like sending around to everyone I knew who had ever been at Blizzard or was there at the time. I was like, is this guy real? Is this a person? And they were all like, yeah, that's our boss. Um, <laughs> so, so that was, I mean, I, I was just thoroughly uh, and serendipitously lucky that uh, mm -hmm. they, they came to be and they asked uh, if I would like to. So. Uh, I don't really have a good answer for that kind of question. I've never been very good at pursuing jobs. I tend to follow one very simple rule, which is that when you are negotiating prices, ask for about 20% more than you think you deserve. Uh, and apart from that, uh, you know, like if you if you if you like a potential client, you like their IP, you like their work, you like whatever it is. Um, then hopefully your work will reflect what part of that IP you like. And so hopefully that will reflect back to the client something that they see in your work that they can use in their future projects. I love uh, Blizzard's work. At least I, um, I, I love the aesthetic of their work. I've never been like a, or and not since Warcraft, like the RTS games, I haven't been like a huge Blizzard gamer, but I do thoroughly enjoy the, the sort of very charming, clunky, um, bulky fantasy world that they've created, and the fact that they don't take it too seriously is very charming to me. So I, I, I think I've sort of taken on some parts of that aesthetic in my work, but not overly consciously, but I think, I mean, according to them, I've had some talks with them after I got hired, um, and apparently that's what sort of appealed to them, was that it seemed that I could apply my work and, and, and add something new to their aesthetic. So I think... Yeah. You know, in the long run, you, you're going to have to chase clients sometimes, and that's, you know, I don't have any good real rules for that. But just try and be, uh, try and be honest to yourself when you're trying to uh, establish 
whatever artistic impulses you want to have. Uh, you know, it needs to be what you find cool, and then go and be creative in your problem solving. I think you actually lead into a pretty good question uh, that um, I, I've heard this before, and actually I want your opinion on it. Is the uh, you know you said that there's there are two different types of people that you know get hired on for jobs usually. There are the people who actually make a portfolio that's catered to a client trying to get a job with that client, mm -hmm. and then there are the people who just do what they want and clients come to them. Yeah. So you know, like I mean. Would um, actually, I'm not even sure what the question of that really is. <laughs> like, <laughs> like well, would you prefer the method of just doing what you want and hoping that you know it's good enough for clients to come? To more, I guess. <laughs> well, again, that's a pretty good question, and I've had that talk with a bunch of fellow artists um, when we talk about you know how how do I get work for this client and how do I get work for this client, and I think it kind of depends on the client, and let's say. Riot, for example, is a great example. I've done a little bit of work for Riot, and the um, thing is, Riot, if you try and cater your portfolio to Riot, they are probably not going to hire you, because Riot already has have the best people in the business to do exactly what they have in their portfolio already. So there's no reason for them to hire you unless you, for some reason, can do the either better than these people, or you can do it cheaper. And they already have all the money in the world, so they're not going to care about the money. So what you need to do is to then become that person who can add something extra, right? So if you look at like their, their, their splash screen work, you can always see that the next guy they take on is someone who adds a little bit extra. Either that person is really good with perspective because Riot loves you know, bending perspective, or there's someone who does something subtle and beautiful with color in a period where Riot is interested in that. Taking on or getting work from, from Riot becomes one of those pitfalls of the industry because it probably has a lot to do with who you know and who your contacts are. Um, mm. but, they're, but, but it's a good example of they're probably going to hire people they find interesting, not people who can already do what they're already doing. I mean, they, you're going to have to be able to solve the general problems of a splash screen, but sh you know, further than that, it doesn't need to go. You need to be someone who can put in something extra for them. Uh, same goes for, for like Warhammer, for example. Actually, that's a bad example right now because of other reasons, but it goes for an animated franchise. You need to be able to be someone who can emphasize something new and interesting, not someone who can recycle what they've already done. That's my take on it. Anyway. It seems to have worked so far. So just be yourself and be interesting. Simple enough. <laughs> well, yeah, that that that, that becomes kind of uh, yeah, that that does become kind of loose and fast, doesn't it? Um, no, but I mean, when when you say be interesting, like okay, so art or painting, painting and drawing essentially is problem solving, right? And we learn a lot from observing how earlier artists have solved certain problems. Like if you if you look at like I do, I look at a lot of uh, Kim Jong Gi, for example. He's a brilliant problem solver. Um, but if I learned all my anatomy and all my uh, perspective use from him, um, all my stuff would look like Kim Jong Gi's work, just slightly worse because you know I'm not as good as he is. So rather than doing that, I'll look at a bunch of his work, then I'll put it away, and then I'll go do a bunch of studies, and those studies will be influenced by his work to some degree, but they'll still be studies of something else. And then, as long as you apply yourself to your studies, and, and you study rather than copy, you'll get something new out of that. And then if you base your further work on those studies, then that will very much you know, um, contain the essence of what you're trying to do, rather than the copy of someone else's work. And that, I think, is how you make yourself interesting for other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like, I, I've always thought it's much better instead of focusing on one particular artist you like and trying to replicate their style. Just go and find elements of many different artists that you like, as well as mixing in things that you feel naturally inclined to do. That way, you get like a much greater spectrum, and you'll have you'll be creating something new. You know. Yeah, and when you find some artist that you think does something particular well. Try to figure out why you like that, not just, oh, I like that, I should do that too. But try, you know, go, go one question further, because this is a lot about asking the right questions. You know? mm -hmm. So why is this interesting? What is it that he does that I find compelling? And how is it he does that? You know? Like when, Kim, when you watch Kim Yoon, and I'm going to use him a lot as an example, because he is brilliant. But when he does what he does, it's not just because he knows perspective. It's not just because he knows source material. It's because the man can think in four-point perspective. So he doesn't need to draw that stuff out. But it's not that he just knows this stuff and he says he's not an autist, you know? 
it's not a talent. We can probably have a long discussion about the nature of talent because I don't really believe in that. But <laughs> oh, we don't it's either. Not, it's not, we it's not that. a talent. It's not a talent. It's a skill, and it's a very yeah. hard one skill. And that's what makes it interesting. It's because he can do something that I can't, like uh, that I can barely comprehend. So it's almost like magic, you know. Yeah. Uh, that really hit the nail on the head for me. Like I completely, uh, I completely agree with it being a skill over just something you're just born with. You know, there's just no way you can. It's something that requires knowledge. You have to seek out that information, and you have to work hard to acquire it. Yeah, like I think that, uh, like, you know, if, like, for example, if you were trying to, like, uh, possibly, like, obtain that ability of thinking in four point, four point perspective or whatever, like that, all the time, or, you know, if you were trying to do something like that, then you would have to say, okay, I'm going to sit down for, like, studying anything. You'd have to sit down for, like, 30 minutes every day and be like, okay, I'm going to try to think this way, you know, but, like, try not to look at other people's work and mimic it or anything like that. Just think about what you're trying to do and do it your own way because any mistakes you make, or, or not, not really mistakes, but like anything you don't do that's in accordance to that will be kind of you. You know, that'll that'll bring something new about. So, no, I, I completely agree. Anyway, had to rant. That was uh, another long-winded, yeah. Not yeah. Another long-winded answer. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, were you willing to maybe do like a demo or something? Or are you, uh, I mean, you don't have Yeah, to. I mean, I can, uh, right now I'm actually, I'm actually working on a piece. I could show you that. Uh, yeah, that'd be fun. I can, I can do a short demo of something if you'd rather do that. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of up to you guys. If, if you if you want to keep talking, then it's probably easier for me to just doodle on on this thing. Because if I have to, if I, if I do a demo, then it's gonna be, uh, then I'm gonna be a lot more boring <laughs> talking. I uh, know. That's. I mean, that's cool. You can either you can either work on the piece, or we can do the demo, or whatever. It doesn't even matter. Yeah. Right. Actually, let's do a demo. That's fun. All right. Okay. Because yeah. right, right now I'm actually just sitting and rendering, which is not the most fun and thing in the world to watch. So let's do that. Okay. So what would you guys like to see? Actually, give me a couple of random words and let's see what we can uh, tinker out. Okay. Uh. So, well, see, you just got hired on the Blizzard, so let's think fantasy. Uh, something like. All right. So what? Two or three words. Uh. Say skull. T take take skull for example, <laughs> and then uh, elf. Elf is pretty fantasy, generic stuff. Um, and Cole, pick a word. <laughs> Let's make it a female character. <laughs> female elf. Skull. I'm working on a female character, so you'd, you'd be helping me out. All right. All right. All right. Well, actually, that works. Okay, so I've, I've been have toying with this idea lately of like feral elves, kind of you know like if you want to know Warhammer at all, you'll know like the the wood elves in Warhammer. They're not as um, as nice and gentle as their high elf brethren. They're very yeah, they're pretty feral. So I like that idea of like you know el elves that don't really go with the whole Tolkien ideal. So let's do something like that. Right. Okay. Uh, So keep asking questions, because that'll... All right, cool. Talk. <laughs> some, some people don't like to talk while they're... Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. I have a hard time talking whenever I'm painting myself, so... Um, well, do you, like... Well, primarily, like, most people that work, like, in the industry, they have, like, a, like a specialty or, you know, something that they usually have, like... Uh, I've heard like a lot about like making portfolio where it's like you know they say have something like have a portfolio where it says you can do everything but have like a specialty that your work is geared toward that way you get jobs that you want. Yeah, uh, like uh, being be, being a jack of all trades is not going to do you any good if you're a master of none. Mm -hmm. So you know, and and this usually sort of boils down to what you enjoy doing. A lot of people uh, that I know, at least some of them have, you know, a prevalence for pretty much anything. They love, you know, doing both vehicles and landscapes and characters and whatever. But they're usually better at one thing than another. So, you know, for, for, for the sake of ease and for sake of, you know, being able to earn money, I would suggest building a portfolio that, that reflects your strengths and then if you want to keep, you know, improving yourself, do that. 
as well. But make sure, make sure when you choose what to study, when you, when you choose what to uh, choose what to sort of go for, then uh, you know, lever leverage your strengths and then uh, work on your weakest weaknesses. Would you say your area is like more along the lines of like character art? Because I've seen like, yeah. a lot of your people oh, yeah. very character based. I'm I'm definitely a character centric uh, artist. Most of my work, even the illustration work, is very sort of character based. Mm -hmm. um, which I mean, I, I I know, and I consider that. I mean, I consider my lack of uh, comfort with doing you know environment and industrial design a weakness in in many ways. But I never had any need to uh, to do industrial design. I never had any need to do uh, uh, you know vehicle design. Uh, and I, I, as much as I admire people who can do it, it never really gave me anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if I got into sci-fi more, which I probably will. I mean, the new Star Wars movies coming out. If, if let's say, if the new Star Wars movies are good, then you might start seeing more sci-fi from me. <laughs> <laughs> but it kind of depends. Like I, I read Dune, you know, I, I love that. But Dune to me, as much as it is, it truly is sci-fi. Like I, I understand, but. It doesn't really leverage science much. It leverage leverage fantasy, so it's more fantasy it's in like space. It's like a hybrid, I think, like a sci-fi fantasy because they have like the a lot of sort of magical elements to it. Yeah, so it becomes more like fantasy in space. But you know, did you guys see uh, The Martian, the new uh, movie? Yeah, yeah, I got to. I watched it actually this past week. Yeah, I mean, like that that yeah. is sci-fi. Yeah. Right, because that is actually science fiction. That's really Scott. You know, like he. Uh, I think that he, he has a really he's really good at like pulling from that. You can definitely tell that he he loves like the that particular like a uh, kind of genre. Yeah. So, like I I'd, uh, I'd love to get to a point where I find that as appealing as you know drawing me some some cool dwarves and some cool knights. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just it, it's you know I've I've got to a point now where I'm getting pretty comfortable with doing those things and I'm getting pretty comfortable with uh, designing armor. And, and my understanding of, of that theater of, of uh, material. So maybe I'll start doing other things as well. Mm -hmm. I oh. keep rambling, don't I? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, uh, like, when you're talking about, like, studying armor, uh, like, what would you actually, like, recommend for, like, when you go to, like, when you go to do a study, what is, like, one of the first things that you do? Oh, um, ask a question. That is definitely the first thing I like doing. So let's say I want to study armor, right? Um, the, the trick is don't find the coolest picture of armor you can, because usually that will be derived more from posing, composition, and lighting than it will be of armor design. What you want to do is you want to, for most people, especially when they start with armor design, it's because they want to make a character. So then ask yourself, like, what's the basis of your character? What's the background of your character? What would it be reasonable reasonable for this character's armor to be based on, and um, and then go and find you know applicable armor, uh, study it, figure out how it's designed and why it was designed the way it was, you know like if you want to make a character that's you know loosely based on say the Mongols, or or the Romans or whatever, go and figure out why the armor that the period uh, reference you have is the way it is and why the wearers of it would construct it the way they did because. Yeah, like what was their logic behind it? Exactly. Basically. You'd be both both fascinated and surprised on the depth of history that's behind the most mundane pieces of armor. Just you know, like you know the the classic Roman armor, the uh, Aurelia Segmentata. It is the I mean, as far as Roman armor goes, that is actually quite unusual um, because it was a fairly short period of time that the Romans were able to produce that piece of armor because they were very reliant on. Uh, rolled steel from Germania, and they were reliant on a lot of spe very specific resources. So the moment they started losing control of these sort of outlying uh, parts of the empire, they could no longer produce it in mass and you know equip a whole legion with it. So I don't think, I mean, ch chainmail, for example, the reason why that's such a prevalent piece of armor throughout at least Western history and a lot of Eastern history as well, is because it's fairly easy to manufacture on mass, and it's a very effective piece of armor. Mm -hmm. You know, get, getting to grips with with those pieces of history is really interesting. At least, you know, I, <laughs> depends. I mean, some people are going to find it interesting. Some people are going to find it absolutely deathly boring. But personally, I find that to be it. It really sort of it, it does put an extra layer of uh, of interest and 
and uh, depth into the characters you can create when you start under, uh, understanding all the layers of um, uh, of intrigue and, 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 and uh, information mm -hmm. that goes into the the design of a good character. Yeah, I yeah. completely agree. I think I think it's very important to have some kind of narrative in mind and some kind of history behind the character to really actually create something interesting because if you're just randomly kind of designing things without any purpose behind it, then that's when you get like, you know, generic knight number 47, you know, whatever. They're just pumping these out. But if you can put yeah, something in there that, you know, expresses something about that character, I think that's important. And then you also brought up an interesting point about art in general, in my opinion, like, to be good at drawing anything, you have to really learn about every aspect of it. Like, I, I equate it to, you know, you have to understand it sort of inside and out if you want to portray it, you know, on the page correctly. So I, I think, like, learning, you know, art will force you to sort of expand, you know, your knowledge base. And anything that you want to draw, you're going to have to invest that sort of time in to, to do it justice, I think. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's kind of the thing of the moment you understand that drawing as much as anything else is the drawing is the art of creating marks that can convey um, the information that you want to convey in the most elegant way you can. That is the, the true art of drawing. And so when you realize that it's it's essentially as, as much as language, that, that justifies trying to understand the source material as in-depth as you can because it means you can convey the information with a greater understanding of it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the more the more informed the narrative behind whatever you're doing is, uh, you know, the, the better the piece is just going to be. That's that's really just as simple. Like, you know, if you're, you know, rather than just trying to, like you said, Cole, just doing generic ideas. So that's, that's the huge importance of just doing studies in general. And there's something like slightly heartbreaking about seeing really good artists do like really crappy armor design because they're yeah. sitting going like, oh, this could have been so great, and you fucked it up. Yeah, they have like all that technical information, but they just, you know, like they sort of become numb, I guess, to, to ideas. You know, they 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 haven't exercised their design. They've they've invested so much time just regurgitating instead of uh, exploring. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, regurgitating is a very good idea. And you know, um, uh, Hayao Miyazaki, he had a very good word. Like he, the reason why he hates the, the the anime culture in Japan is because it's full of otaku's, which means like guys who have, well, in the sense that he used it in that interview, I think was that it was guys who had learned the art of manga through watching other manga artists rather than going out and sort of learning how to draw for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he really dislikes that because it leads to what he called artistic incest. And I think you can you can see a lot of that in, in concept art, for example, that people have learned to draw and they've learned their aesthetics from other concept artists rather than going out and uh, and sort of learning to draw from other influences. Yeah, because then, you know, if you're not pioneering your own thing, then, you know, you're just basically doing something somebody already established, so it's probably not going to be as good because you're trying to copy them. You know, there's there's no, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not bringing anything new to the table. If you're not trying yeah. to, you know, pioneer your own your own ideas. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. So is this uh, like when you're doing character work? Is this like typically how you start out, like just kind of laying in a sketch in this in this vein, or does it vary? Yeah, it depends on on on, on the work and the client. Because if it's for an IP that I am comfortable and, and and happy with, then I'll just go and doodle around. It. And, and find some cool reference from from their IP and sort of try and come up with cool ideas and then I'll doodle around and uh, come up with a good couple of ideas and I'll send it out to a client and, and see what they think and we'll talk a little bit and then I'll move on and then I'll try then I'll try and not get too much feedback from them for a while so I can come up with some cool ideas because essentially they're paying me to come up with ideas that they couldn't come up with so I, I don't want I don't I don't because it's their baby essentially you know like the, the IP is their baby so I know that they're going to become overprotective if I keep coming back with too many iterations so then I'll work it up to like a good detailed sketch and come back and get a bit of feedback and then go back and sort of keep working but technique wise this is a lot like what I would do so I'm going to take it to about like this is just going to be a portrait so I'll take it about this far, and then I'm gonna 
turn the opacity down a little bit, <clears throat> and then add a new layer, and go over with a darker line to sort of start working out some details. Are you going and doing like a just a general line work? Yeah, like I'm not going to do something like super uh, clean with the lines. I usually wouldn't do that with a with a uh, with the line art anyway, unless unless the line art is I mean, if it's specifically sort of uh, for character art that needs to be super detailed and the client wants to be very hands on, then I'll do very detailed line art because that means I can usually go get away with doing that for detail work, and then when the client has signed up on the, up on the line art, they've more or less signed up on the final piece, apart from the color. So all mm -hmm. I need to do then is put in the flat colors, send it over again, get them to sign up on essentially the color scheme, and then I can sit down and, and add you know, volumetrics and light and whatever until I'm done, and then go back and maybe like have to move this thing like a little bit to the right and maybe um, you know, do, do tiny little adjustments. But that is a fairly efficient way of work, working. I remember and, you. Um, or sorry, Travis. Oh, you're good. Go ahead. Yeah, I was noticing uh, for your initial sketch layer, um, you use kind of a uh, your your colors like faded to blue a little bit, like as a cool color. Is that is that like part of your strategy for like keeping it really light so you can do the darker, like finer tuned lines after? Uh, yeah. I mean, I just went with blue because I felt it was pretty, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, usually I'll choose my, my line color depending on what I want to do with the light. So right now, for example, I have a, I have a warm but desaturated yellow that I might turn off the saturation on uh, as I go into color. But essentially, if I choose a cold light, for example, then I'll want, because the line usually represents something that's going to be indicative of shadow, or at least pressure, then um, it'll be a nice counterweight to uh, to the light later, and it'll make it easier to sort of fade it into the shadows. Um, that's because okay, I'll, I'll I'll show you later in the thing, in the in the demo. But uh, essentially, the, I'm gonna be putting this this line layer into either hard light or multiply, and then sort of paint over it later. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. It's just a it's just an easier way of uh, getting away with not having to clean up your line art too much. No, it's really clever. That's always my favorite thing, like from these type of things, is to like get strategies, you know. Yeah, figuring out like other people's like workflow and stuff, and how you can kind of adapt it to your own thing. It's definitely... Exactly. Like just seeing this has already given me like quite a few ideas. Yeah, you know, like it's uh, it's it's always fascinating. I think um, you know, it's one thing to look at somebody's art. Like usually you can break it down and kind of figure out generally like what they did, but when you actually get to watch somebody like, you know, right in front of you live, do it, and also explain sort of their, the logic behind their decisions and their rationale, like, you just gain so much more, I think. Yeah, agreed. By the way, if you... There's a you lot of that, to... like, in your uh, early studio work, like, just watching, did you watch, like, a lot of your peers kind of like this and just see, like, their general decisions and sort of how they were thinking about their, their work or, like, picking their brain? Oh, yeah, a lot. Especially, I would. Uh, I was a very big fanboy of Ruan Gs, so um, yeah, I would. I would spend a lot of time just like picking his brain. And the thing is, like his English wasn't great at the time, so we spent a lot, a lot of time deciphering one another's language. But it was a, it was a good way of, of, of learning too, because then he had to be quite creative in the way that he described things, and you kind of really have to sit down and rather than just listening to. Um, Listening to you know the words, you have to really get in there and, and figure out exactly what he's meaning to say. Which is it was it was one of those things where it seemed like a burden at the time, but in hindsight, I think it probably let me learn more than I would have if his English was flawless. Yeah, because you really had to like actually focus into every detail of what he was saying, and uh, you know it just made it it made it so much more probably um, like an intensive exercise to sort of break down what he's trying to convey to you. Uh, when you were saying you went to, uh, you said you went to art school earlier, and that the life drawing was like a huge aspect, of, like helping you. Uh, where did you learn like the brunt of your fundamentals, though? Like, did you go through any of Loomis' stuff? Did you do uh, the James Gurney book, like Color and Light? I know a ton of people that do that for their light understanding. Yeah, uh, I got Loomis. I got um, into when I was in art school. Like that was one of the one of the things that I'm very 
I, get, I have a lot of gripes with art schools in general. The one thing that that article did was introduce me to Loomis, and uh, I ate that shit up the moment I got my hands on it. Like they they introduced the fact that like all his books are free online. Like you can find the the PDF files of his, and mm. it's because it's in public domain and it's on this page called uh, Save Loomis. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's fantastic. You start with this fun with the pencil, and you start realizing just this guy had such a depth of knowledge of uh, of drawing. And it was because at, up until that point, even though I started taking drawing pretty seriously, there was just you know you don't really have a, a conception of, of how deep you can go. And so yeah. having this guy who clearly like from the first images you see him draw or have drawn in these books, you just realize that he's just you know. Just, just dimensions beyond you in terms of drawing, and uh, then having him just break down his his entire thought pattern around how to draw, and the, that first book, Fun with a Pencil, mm -hmm. it's so mind opening and so mind blowing. So yeah, I I I, uh, I sketched the hell out of Loomis when I found his books, and uh, Gurney as well. Like when I uh, was introduced to the color and light book, that changed my uh, changed my perception of, of of how to do color and how to do how to, how to treat color and light. The only the only thing I would and, and this is this is half sort of pimping a friend, but mostly because it blows my mind every time I listen to him talk about it. But uh, if you can get your hands on um, Mike Acevedo's talk on treating color and light, that I would just suggest to everyone. It, every time I I heard him talk about it live, and I've heard I've seen his uh, his gum wrote about it, and they're they're pretty similar, but it is by far the best understanding of, of color I've ever come across. So I would suggest that. I'll definitely make a note of that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, the first time that me and Travis opened up Loomis and, like, kind of how, how eye-opening that was, you know, like, just to see that, you know, this this is possible in every aspect of visualization is, is quantifiable, you know. Mm. I think that's really when it like set in that this is like purely, you know, it is it is a skill, you know, that can be acquired if you're willing to put in the requisite amount of effort to to attain it. Yeah, exactly. Like it's it is it, it's such an uplifting thing. Like I remember because I I discovered it with another friend of mine, and he was so off put by this book because he was like, oh shit, what is this? Like you can never get this good. And it's so emphatically said in the beginning of that book that yeah, all you need to do is just study. Just you know, this is. This is just another discipline. Just get into it, and and I was so uplifted by reading that and, and seeing that book and all the exercises and started going through it. And the thing he does when he starts like trying to make you understand the how to sort of turn an object in space, the whole like head exercise. Yeah, the rotation. Yeah, and you start doing that for the first time, and your mind is blown because you're like, oh, I can understand something in three dimensional space and turn it in my head. What magic is this? Yeah, <laughs> every every page in like successful drawing I remember was just like the most like amazing thing to me. Like when we were uh, going through it, like uh, yeah. Oh, it'll it'll Almost give you headaches for sure. Like there'll be moments where you're like trying to comprehend it and you still can't figure it out, and you're like, yeah. What's I remember going on? me and Travis trying to figure out the incline plane section, and, and like we we went oh, yeah. we had like several conversations about it, trying to figure it out. And, like, everything was, like, we just went from, like, one ridiculous notion to the next until we finally broke it down. But, like, moments like yeah. that are great. Uh, yeah. Right, and then when you manage to solve it, it's like a great puzzle. And you get that you get that eureka moment where it's, where all the pieces sort of fall together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're just like, oh, my God, I have to oh. go like, practice this now, like, so many times, so I make sure that I remember it for sure. Yeah, but it, then it becomes, like, it becomes this awesome little treasure hunt, and then you get the treasure, and you're so fucking happy. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we actually haven't gone through uh, uh, Loomis's creative illustration book yet, and oh. yeah, we're... Uh, that, that one's a doozy. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready for it, because, like, I was looking, like, because it goes over composition, it goes over color, it goes over value, and, like, that... Actually, like, how Loomis puts stuff, it's, like, uh, one of the guys in the uh, the grind hangout sessions that we do, which is just Google Hangout where we all get together and study. <laughs> he says that Loomis speaks to him, you know. And it, <laughs> I, I can't put it any better than that because it's just like how he puts things is so he's he can just describe things so well. Yeah. That yeah, it's just yeah, I, you can't say much beyond that. Yes. 
Oh, just to sort of like cut the uh, the hero, because I mean it, it does become hero worship, and it should it should be it is Loomis, but um, just keep in mind like his most of his his illustration work is still very very almost trite um, commercial work. So like when you want to get into like more dynamic illustrations and stuff, there are other artists that also are, I mean he does he does interesting work, but it was mostly you know for commercial stuff. Yeah, he did like magazines and uh, like movie, like, or not movie, but uh, like you know, like billboard banner stuff and things like that. Yeah, and I don't, I don't remember if he mentions that thing, but always w- when someone starts coming up with a a set of rules for uh, for any part of drawing or painting, just remember that I mean, treat it as the pirate's code. You know, these are guidelines; they're not rules. You don't have to follow them. Um, Al Brady. Art is like an evolving thing too, so it's you know it doesn't remain stagnant. I mean, there's like if you look at like Scott Roberts and stuff, you know he's taken perspective, you know, even further than what the Loomis books have. So like you know, it, I think it constantly you have to be open to uh, to 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 the change. Yeah, yeah. but even more than that, like um, Al Brady, whose online moniker is usually Old Face Killer, he uh, he had this brilliant line when we were in Zagreb at the ICC, and he said. That his his compositions were usually considered pretty goofy, and then he just turned around and said, "Which is a good thing, because I like goofy compositions or awkward <laughs> awkward compositions." And it's up until that point, people would have sort of pointed out that, yeah, like these these compositions don't really follow, you know, the the generally accepted rules of good comp- composing. And you're like, yeah, that's true, you know, kind of you know deducts from from the the sum total of the work. And then you go like, yeah, but they still look fucking kick ass. So there must be some some positive here that we're not seeing, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I know that, uh, uh, you, you were mentioned something about how, like, Loomis' drawings aren't, like, very dynamic or whatever, and to go, like, seek out other artists and such, and the, uh, um, another person that we haven't gotten into yet, but, like, we were considering looking at his books because of Marco Jojovic's work was, a uh, Hogarth. Um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, yeah, definitely look at Hogarth, but take Hogarth with a Big ass, like, just pinch of salt. Because uh, oh, yeah. he's essentially, he's he's what happens when 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 you give Loomis steroids. Like it's, um, I don't know. Like it, it's it's a good way of doing dramatic, overemphasized posing. But I've never seen anyone pull off like a very interesting illustration with with poses based on that because it becomes, I mean, mm. mo- early Marvel stuff is basically what Hogarth is, and. Um, I mean, it, it's theatrical and it's pretty cool, but it's very dated and it becomes sort of silly looking in the long run. But I think, I, th- I think if you want so- someone like if you want, um, what's his name again? Klein, Heinrich Klein. Um, same sort of era, very good. I'll, I'll see if I can find the name. But uh, Claire Wendling. If you want posing and you want someone who really fucking understands that stuff, Claire Wendling is the person to look at, just for. Brilliant mark making and fantastic understanding of posing and action, and uh, and also uh, this German girl uh, Saskia Gutekunst, uh, she's also just amazing at that sort of stuff. But if, yeah, it's generally if you want if you want to look into the dynamics, look at look into animation. I mean that they, those people have been doing that for years and they're amazing at it. Those people that made it sound very other, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it, it it is a it is a point to be made that you know if you if you look at artists that come out of illustration, that, uh, animation. I mean, they tend to be masters of dynamic posing and and interesting use of composition and and and, uh, and all that stuff because they know how to bend it. They know how this thing works in succession. Yeah, that was one of my initial attractions to things like a uh, manga and like anime is mm-hmm. because like a lot of those people, that, especially people who are really good uh, at like. I mean, their work isn't, like, super stylized. They can, like, do this amazing dynamic posing. Mm. And I don't, I don't know. That was, like, it, it's... They, they, they can do it in a very nice compositional way most of the time. So, like, that's... I don't know. That's something I always, like, gravitated toward. But Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, but, but again, like... Um... Again, like, be careful with your influences there because there's a lot of... Uh... Anime that, that has that sort of fallen into the pitfalls of feeding off its own artistic input, so so that it becomes like manga based on manga based on manga based on manga. Yeah. 
that's not your problem. Like, the really good ones are invariably the ones that manage to make something interesting uh, and new. Hmm. So what do you what are you doing now? Like what what what? Okay, so I'm, I'm just trying to make like some some slightly interesting background noise that I can sort of use for inspiration for light later. Hmm. So basically, just like drop in some color. Uh, I'm trying to make some nice vibrance between my colds and my uh, my lights and something. I mean, usually when I do sketches, I'll do this. Um, I'll be more uh, more. Uh, thoughtful about it if I'm doing something for a client. Uh, usually I'll try and use colors that mean something to the, the character and the client. Um, so like if you're doing a, a bad guy, you know, usually uh, a darker palette, maybe something that you know, has to do with their particular character, it's a good idea. Uh, but right now I'm just sort of playing around with, with oranges and yellows and blues because that's what I felt like right now. <laughs> How long does an illustration like this usually take you? You know, so. Um, it depends on like. Yeah, like I don't know uh, how much of time we spent so far on this. It's been uh, like 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Usually, I'll take for for a portrait sketch like this. Uh, I don't know, maybe like an hour and a half. Depends on how detailed and how far I want to go with it. Uh, but for the purposes of a demo, uh, yeah. Probably an hour is a nice cutoff point because I'll probably get all the applicable bits in, and then uh, the rest will be rendering essentially. But yeah, like I did, I did a demo at the IFCC this year, for example, and that was about an hour and a half. And that was like an owl wizard. <laughs> so essentially, what I'm doing right now is just establishing a silhouette for him, for her. I'm not entirely sure if this is a man or woman. I'm guessing it's a dude. The jawline is pretty masculine. Um, and essentially, the, the color I'm using for the silhouette doesn't really matter. I'm probably going to do something based around forest colors, but that's not necessarily... Um, I mean, that, that, yeah, it, it's not necessarily... I'm just going to establish the silhouette so that I can uh, add the other layers on as uh, clipping masks so that I don't have to worry about the silhouette. Yeah, that way you're just going and laying a base and then do a clipping mask. That way it's like already just there and you don't have to worry about it. Exactly. Nice. It's a very handy little tool. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's actually like something that, like, I, I used to kind of see it as like this weird, like, hindrance kind of thing where it was like, I was afraid to do things like clipping masks and stuff like that, like Photoshop, because I was like, I was afraid, like, if I picked up, like, oil, I was trying to think of it like if, if I picked up oil paints, could I still do this painting? <laughs> That is exactly how I used to think about it, too. Like, that thing of, if I can't do this in real life, I shouldn't do it in digital. That sort of thing. <laughs> but that, that's, that's as much... I mean, you, you could go, you know, you could go ad reductum in that into infinity. So you could say, you know, if I can't do this with sticks and stones, I shouldn't do it with oils. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and, I mean, as, as long as you're not using any, any particular tool as a crutch, then it's fine, you know? As long as as long as the effect that you're trying to achieve isn't um, isn't entirely dictated by the tool, but by your vision for what you want to do, then I say it's perfectly fine to use whatever tool you want. Yeah, as long it's, as it like speeds you up and you're not like you said using it as a crutch. Yeah, like if if you could do no, if you could not do lighting at all without say the color dodge tool. By the way, if you want to do clipping mask really easy, just hold Alt and click on the sort of line between. The layer you want to add on to a top of another one, you get that like weird little icon there, and you can oh, sort wow. of click it on and off. Very nice little. Actually, I didn't know that. Yeah, the new trick. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. But yeah, like th 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 that's my hard and fast rule on that. Like if 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 it is a if it is, if it is a tool that you need to do something, like if you need color dodge to do your lighting, if you need. Uh, if you need multiply to do values, and you could not possibly do it with that, then I would suggest going and studying some values and studying some lighting and trying to figure that set up stuff out without that particular tool. For example. So you have to just be honest with yourself. Like, is this a tool or is it a crutch? And if it's a crutch, you might want to strengthen those muscles so you can throw away the crutch. Uh, like, how, how long is that? Well, I think the right way to word this question. Like, how, how long did you do, like, 
Well, yeah, traditional before you jumped into digital. <clears throat> Where you oh, that's traditional good. first? That was a good long while, actually. Uh, I only picked up digital when I was uh, 18, I guess. Yeah, that's when I started my sketchbook at uh, at Concert Auditory, I think. Um, yeah, I was re I was real skeptical to, to to digital for a long time, exactly for the reason we just talked about. And um, it was uh, my the same guy, uh, Jesper, who's my best friend. He uh, he kind of got me into digital because he um, he had a laptop and I didn't have a laptop, and he had started using Photoshop, and I was fascinated and a little skeptical to that whole uh, <coughs> that whole thing. I thought it, you know, it seemed fascinating enough, but there was a lot of buttons to click, and I wasn't really, I mean, all I would use computers for were, you know, video games and whatever. So I, I thought it was weird, and I, I mean, I still, I, I'm still kind of struggling with that, with the whole, like, getting into other programs. Like, I, I still cannot do 3D, for example, and I know I should learn it, and I'm, I mean, if, if, if one place you should go and try and learn stuff, like Blizzard is a great place because they have, like, really great learning facilities, so I'm probably going to try and learn it again. But every 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 couple of years, I go back and I try and learn 3D, and I usually have to just run away screaming because something <laughs> goes terribly wrong. Like it's just yeah, it's just something. But I mean, I I'll, I'll do clay. I love doing clay. I love doing super sculpting. Like playing around with shapes and forms is fun. It's just this is translation of 2D into 3D. That kind of fucks me up. And not a not a huge fan of like. Uh, the aesthetic that a lot of people get out of the combining 2D and 3D. So as long as I don't have to do it, I'll probably just stick with, with manual 3D and try and get good at that. Hmm. Speaking of manual 3D and like the, the power of that, do you guys know about uh, Simon Lee, also known as Spider Zero online? Uh, no, I, I personally don't. Yeah. Uh, if you find the time, Google that guy. Actually, he's on, he's on Facebook as well, but like, yeah, his work is bar none, some of the most interesting concept work I've ever seen. And he does all his concepts in like, special clays and stuff, but he can do he can do like concepts, concept sculpts quicker than most people can do like a concept piece of concept art. So like, if, if, if people if people want to stick with traditional, he's a, he's a good example of someone who can do that. Wow. I mean, that's... Yeah, man. Uh, when, when you talk about like, you know, you're working in like, uh, trying to like work in like a uh... Um, 3D, like, do you ever, like, you ever mess with ZBrush at all, or do you just, you know, mostly just, like... Oh, yeah, like, see, I, 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 I tried, like, Sculpt, you know, it was the Sculptress, which was, like, introduced to me as ZBrush for, for retards, but oh, that's, like, that's not a nice <laughs> word, like, like and, and, and still that, like, even that, apart from, like, the very rudimentary stuff was way above my head. I know, I know, like, I could probably sit down and learn it, or maybe, I don't want to be, you know, Accused of hubris, but I think I could probably learn it given the time. But it's just that I get that there's a very strong inner voice in me that screams out, "You could do this two-dimensionally so much quicker, dude!" <laughs> so I tend to I tend to leave the the, the digital 3D to other people. I have great respect for it, but it's not something I I, I dream of doing much. So the uh, the pink you're laying in right now is that to uh, suggest the blood beneath the skin there? Yeah, it's essentially. So what I'm doing now, I, I'm essentially. I'm probably going to do something with the skulls as well, but I'm going to leave the whole color scheme for this thing fairly simple. So what I was doing there was just essentially trying to make some variation within the skin tone. Um, usually I'll put down like very simple skin tones just to um, just to uh, make like a base that I can paint on, um, and then I'll put down just for the sake of this demo, I'm going to be using some layer modes to uh, to do my values. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to probably Probably going to cut my own argument a little short because I'm going to be using some some layer modes to uh, to to uh, increase the pace a little bit. But essentially, uh, I'll I'll paint flat colors and then I'll go over with a multiply layer and essentially do what's called ambient occlusion painting, uh, where you try and deal with the uh, the base shadows and uh, base value structure of the object that you're painting, and then I'll go over with a second layer, which is going to be probably either color dodge or a linear dodge layer, and sort of establish direct light sources, and then I'll go over that and uh, paint everything in on a normal layer on top. So will you eventually just like 
you just completely remove the line art, like once you have it, like all like where everything starts to kind of like pop out and whatnot, or do you just? I mean, is that going to be like part of the finished piece as you go? I mean, in this one, it probably will remain just because um, I probably won't have the time to sort of do the the ambient occlusion all yeah. that clean. But if I if I really went in and sort of cleaned up the ambient occlusion painting, then I then I usually would go in and, and remove the line art underneath just for like a cleaner uh, painted rendering. Uh, but yeah, it, it kind of depends on the end, the end results too. Because sometimes it looks good having the slightly more sort of drawn aesthetic, and sometimes you really want like that that smooth painting finish. Yeah. All right. So, actually, I should probably give this this guy some more paint as well. I think about that while I do this. <laughs> Let's see here, we've talked about portfolios, we talked about IPs, talked about process. What else should we talk about? Good question. What do you uh, what do you do with your like your free time when you're not drawing? Oh, um, <laughs> I've been really bad at that actually. Like I uh, I, I work out a little bit, uh, and again like it's it's. That is that is a great thing about that. There's a great difference between in-house and freelance. Like when when I freelance, I usually only jog because I can do that very happily by myself. But when I'm in-house, I usually try and find other people to go to the gym with and and all that stuff. Uh, so I'm probably gonna start doing that again. Uh, so yeah, I did that. I play a little bit of video games. Uh, mostly, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the lots of the other school series and uh, also the, the Total War series. So I've been I've been replaying Rogue Two lately. Uh, I've just started taking uh, making inroads in Africa, so that's fun. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, there. I mean, when, when I don't draw for work, I do draw quite a bit for myself. So that, yeah, I don't. Know, I cook a little bit. <laughs> but it's, it's not. It's not the most. Uh, most, I talk a lot to people actually. That's taking a lot of my time. Just like keeping up with friends. And just, I move, I've moved around quite a bit, so I have friends on like quite a few different continents. So there's always someone awake. Yeah, that's actually something that's uh, been happening to me now. Like as I've been like as me and Travis have been doing like more of these like online kind of, you know. Just meeting all these people that you're drawing with, like I have friends like on every continent now, <laughs> like every time zone. Yeah, the, you you can no longer use the excuse of no one's awake. I'm just gonna do something else. Yeah. So, uh, do you have like each major like base color there on its own selection? Uh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're... let's see if I'm... I can get them bigger. Yeah, like the the hair, the skin, the skulls—they're all on like different uh, different layers, so that I can, if you hold Control and like click the little window uh, on a layer, you will get like the selection of that layer, so then I can paint within that selection. Gotcha. And usually, usually I'll separate things even more than that if I'm if it's a bigger piece and there will be more details. So, but right now, uh, just going fairly light on it. So I, I figured like I would do this guy hair, this guy's hair sort of like in the style of like dreadlocks, but then play with the texture of moss. Just to play with like the idea of them being from the forest or whatever. Hello. Did I lose you guys? Hello. Hello. Did we drop out? No, no. Oh. All right. I was, uh, was kind of getting lost watching you paint it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Let's all just get quiet and make a, make Evan feel awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if this was a longer piece, would things like the uh, the earrings, like, or like any like like smaller details, would you would you bother putting them on separate selections, or typically would you just kind of lay it well, out I, like this? 
I try and keep my like keep my layer count as low as possible without like making life hard for myself. So if I can pick items that aren't necessarily linked but that are uh, you know, either either close to each other without being connected or overlapping, then I'll put them on the same layers. Like the skull, for example, and the then the earrings made sense to put on the same sort of layer here, for example. Gotcha. I've seen a similar approach with like how Dave Raposa does his comic stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, he does like a he does like a line work when he goes in, throws down a base, and then it's like I think he throws down like the general color for like you know skin, hair, costume, or whatever, and then it's like he works out from there like with the clipping masks like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, cool. I'm, a lot of my work is uh, is pretty heavily heavily influenced by Dave. Like I learned a lot from watching him paint and stuff. So don't be too surprised when you start seeing similarities. Yeah, this this one kind of reminded me almost of like his uh. Like it's sort of in the vein of it's like his like two tone style. Oh yeah, yeah, that is that. that it's not entirely dissimilar, I suppose. It was funny actually, like seeing when he, when those things came out. There was a there were a lot of people sort of testing out that same style. And it was cool to see like the fact that people could get slightly different results by by following a fairly simple formula. Yeah, you're kind of like you kind of got your own like little feel to it as well. Like it's it's similar, but it's not the same. Yeah, it's uh, it's got its own qualities. Yeah, definitely. Also, this becomes much more painted feel in the end. Like a, a lot of that stuff becomes very comic. You know, like it, it reads really nice and sort of two-dimensionally and graphically. This 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 approach does tend to end up more painterly in the end. In your uh, portfolio, like I was, I was looking through it earlier, and uh, like I, I saw that you had like a good balance of sort of like painterly, like realistic stuff, but then also like um, sort of a lot of like almost like uh, what you would expect from like a three D like animated movie kind of art. Are those like you know like your 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 main styles, or do you do you variate it a lot, or do you just try to kind of stay like bouncing around and stay versatile? Yeah, I think I'm guessing you're talking about like the the uh, the splash illustrations. Like yeah, the, I was just kind of scrolling one. through like your uh, your art station. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Just... There's there's a series of illustrations that I did actually for there's a Danish uh, studio called Sun Creature uh, Studios, and they made this uh, animated short called uh, The Reward. And so I did like a bunch of uh, little splash splash illustrations for them, like a bunch of like the, their different character illustrations. That is actually for like a, for animation. Uh, so those characters are are their designs, and then I did like my my take on them. Uh, so yeah, like that, that that was kind of a, a mix of, of their rather more simplistic animated style and then me trying to sort of add a little more little more speciality and a little more uh, my own take on them. Yeah, like I, I noticed they had like a very like three dimensional but it was like painty still. Like uh like I saw like you were able to kinda of incorporate qualities from your more rendered work into them. Which I, I thought was interesting. That was really fun, actually. Like, I, I, uh, I had a lot of fun working on those. That's, that's another example of like trying to get some of your own stuff into someone else's IP, like trying, trying to make a merger of it. That's, that was fun. Would you uh, say you learned quite a bit, like kind of uh, trying to tackle like a different sort of style or aesthetic like that from sort of what you typically do? Yeah, that was that was definitely good. So sort of for for essentially for just taking the time to learning how to apply um, what I already did to a more um, like a simple but still sort of painterly style. Um, that was both uh, bo both for like the purposes of going back and finding out how to have fun with painting, but also <coughs> sorry, I'm, this whole. I don't know if you guys have ever been to California, but this whole thing of like it being warmer outside than inside has given me a severe dry cough. But, uh, <laughs> but what was I saying? Oh yeah, you know, playing around with like the, the degrees of your own style is actually quite interesting, and it can help you a lot with like defining where you want to go with your own style, um, sort of forward. So like that was an unexpected but very happy benefit of doing those illustrations. Yeah, it's something I've noticed. Like whenever I try to uh, 
like mess around with a different style. Like I, I was playing around with like a two tone style, and I, I mostly just kind of try to do like three D kind of rendered things. But like I, I found myself, even though like that was like a completely different star, style from what I normally do, I found myself trying to implement some of that, like what I learned from that, into like my my regular kind of approach. So I, like it's it's interesting to see like even though the styles on the surface look radically different, like what little bits of them you can implement, you know, kind of going back to your your your, your typical style. Hmm. I think it's like all like either there's, there's either like there's like abstraction and then it's like simplification, just like of reality. But they all do kind of like tie in, you know. Whereas like if I'm doing like, I remember looking at like old like comic stuff back in the day and be like, okay, so this is all like two tone stuff, and obviously the lights coming from a specific direction. So if you could figure this out generally really quick, then like wouldn't that in itself help speed up your paint process? Like, yeah, that's that's good. I mean the. That is exactly the right kind of thinking. But it all kind of feeds into this idea of mark making, right? So so it's it's funny to see it. if you vary up your mark making but still keep the same emphasis of of uh, of, of trying to, to get good reading and get you know getting stuff yeah, to stick with like, your own uh, sense of aesthetics, then then you can really vary up your style and have a lot of fun with that. Yeah, I've been looking at a lot of guys lately that um like they uh it's almost like toward impressionism, where they're like able to establish like a like a major plane with like a single brush stroke, mm -hmm. and even though it's so minimalistic, it still reads even to like a realistic level. Like, uh, yeah. it's like amazing to see stuff like that. Like people are able to kind of break it down to that degree and get it to read so sort of like instantaneously. Yeah, I mean that 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 would be the next level of of. Uh, uh, like if if you could start implying that stuff in, in in game design and in concept art and stuff, then I think we would really be talking about like a next level of uh, of gaming aesthetics. Because right now the whole idea of like the next level is just like bringing more detail and more <clears throat> eye to eye realism into it. Yeah, it's all realism. Yeah, and I think like the games I've always enjoyed the most are the ones that establish a style and sort of try and push the technology to emphasize that style. So like Journey, for example, one of my absolute favorite games of all time, did that beautifully and with such a simple style that they it really stuck with <laughs> stuck with me. It's funny that you mentioned that. Like that reminds me of a game called uh, Limbo. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah yeah yeah. That's a good one. Yeah that, that was like that that was like really interesting. Like it wasn't realistic at all. It was like this weird like noir kind of uh, uh, adventure game, like you know, I was like just looking at it in itself was just like, I mean, it really, really kind of like evoked more of an atmosphere you couldn't probably have gotten with realism. No, exactly. But I think it goes back like there's a lot of games that have done that really successfully. If you've seen, have you, if you've ever played, you know, Psychonauts or a lot of games like that, that even now if you go back and play them like ten years later, they still hold up pretty well and they're pretty like they're, they're I mean, they're, they're no longer pushing the envelope in terms of what the technology can do, but they did figure out how far they can push stylization within the constraints of technology at the time. And so when you go back to them now, the style still holds up because it's it's found its integrity in in limiting itself to what they could do at the time. I think that's kind of what gives it its charm too. Like when you kind of go back to that world and every, you know, the art direction, the art direction had such like a distinct feel to it, like, you know, it, it, it kind of puts you into a nostalgic place that if you go and look at, like, the games from that area that were kind of cookie-cutter and we're like, oh, we're just going to try and push realism as far as the technology can, you know, they, they don't stand out as well as the uh, more imaginative games that try to, like, capture a, a unique aesthetic and push the theme with that. Yeah, like, it's the, it's the, that, that, that to me is, like, the big difference between, say, like, a Call of Duty and, uh, like, Borderlands. Yeah, like even you know, no matter how far they go, Borderlands will still look good because like it's, it, it has its own identity. Like, yeah, and, it's, if, and if they make another, if they make another iteration of Borderlands, it's not going to be more realistic. They're just going to have you know, they're probably going to have even nicer lighting. They're going to have bigger worlds. But then, <laughs> no matter how far they go, like with the technology, like it's you know, it it doesn't need more, you know, like to to achieve its its uh, you know its its look. No, exactly. Like the look is already established. The look is fine. 
go, go do all the things more interesting than that. That's something I actually kind of like. I mean, it's nice, but at the same time, it kind of griped me a little bit about like all these HD remakes that we see, where it's like. And then they just come out with these new games. They're like, oh, dude, the graphics are so much better. You can actually see the pores on this dude's skin now. <laughs> you just yeah, kind of... Yeah. You're that, just that, that's why I played it in the first place. I remember now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's ridiculous. Let's see. We're sitting at about an hour and an hour and a half. Cole, do you want to keep keep rolling it, or do you want to, how far do you want to take it? Um, like, uh... Okay, I'll, I'll start, I'll start, I'll start that know, so. Yeah, do you have any time constraints, Evan, or what's, uh, what's the deal? Not really, like, I I haven't until, I have, I have about until midnight, then I'm probably going to collapse, because I was up at, like, four in, four in the morning, so... Mm. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm trying to take this just to, like, the next layer so I can show you guys like how the multiply interacts with the lighting layer because that's kind of how yeah, these two together. Awesome. So this is putting down basically the uh, the value structure that we want, like in terms of darkening it down. So you can see like the flat colors, and then this gives us a good idea of the the direction of the light. So I you know used the very very basic light yeah. setup, you know, top top left down, to so get nice cast shadows that establish and emphasize the the shapes in the face. And it'll also like it'll also give us the chance for some really tasty highlights. Um, so yeah, okay. So the next layer is then kind of depends on what you want to do. And since I went went with sort of warm shadows, I'm got, probably going to go with pretty cold uh, light. So the cold light is probably also going to be because the shadows are pretty uh, pretty saturated here. Probably going to go with fairly desaturated cold light. Um, just becoming kind of a trope in my work, so I'm trying to sort of move away from that a little bit. But for right now, it works fine. So, just trying to, try to balance out the image a little bit. Yeah. So go somewhere around here. And um, linear dodge only like it, it emphasizes essentially uh, like really harsh lighting conditions. So you can go very dark on the actual color you're using, and it'll still give like really good or nice. But yeah, I just really like how the <laughs> how the colors interact on this layer mode. So you can just essentially layer in the light you want. So, this thing upturned um, angles here. Yeah, I love how, like, instantaneously you start to get a real, like, three dimensional feel, especially if the contrasting of the warm and cool, like, Awesome. Yeah, and this and the, the the nice thing is that you don't have to sort of go, um, and and, and constantly fret about uh, having the right the exact right color because it blends pretty nicely, and then you can always go back and forth and and sort of like you know tap back and forth here and use more and less um, saturation to get more uh, and less of the the color you're using in the light, um, and then you can create some real nice vibrance just like laying uh, brush strokes. Uh, perpendicular to one another, and getting like these really nice little senses of uh, of vibrance within, for example, skin tones, or or if you have some sub sub yeah, subsurface scattering going on, stuff like that, without relying too much on overlaying diff different lighting layers, which is pretty nice. It can create a pretty pretty decent and not like VFX looking uh, effect. I do find that with a lot of people, with a lot a lot of stuff that relies very heavily on on, uh, on a lot of like layer modes is that you get that, that kind of um, very sort of readable VFX look where everything kind of looks like it's taken out of a J.J. Abrams movie. Not that there's yeah. anything wrong with that, but it can become kind of boring and doesn't really suit like fantasy. Fantasy, I, I always find like the better fantasy, like I, this is not a hard and fast rule, like this is sometimes wrong, but the best fantasy usually is the stuff that looks like it's made with slightly old techniques. So, if you take your, if you use your your, your specific layers for for setting up your pieces and then go back and sort of really paint stuff in and make it look nice and brushy and um, uh, and kind of old, it usually reads better for fantasy. And like if you use a lot of, like you know, like if you want to use lens flares, don't do that in fantasy. Is what I'm saying. 
Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a lens flare effect used in a fantasy piece. <laughs> no, I, I, one should hope. I think I've actually seen that a couple of times, and it's like, yeah, this person found an effect he likes and hasn't really considered how that is affecting the piece. You know? I mean, I, I guess there's some things you can do, like with those kind of effects that can kind of be like really cool, but like if you're trying to, I don't know, like particularly when you're like, I think when you're painting an image, at least. I've always kind of stuck to it. No matter how realistic it should go, it should always still kind of feel like a painting. Because it's like, I don't know, it's like it's been the nature of the medium, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there are some people who can do, you know, like that, I hesitate to call it photorealistic, because it isn't that, but it does read as, like, hyper-realism. Yeah, like, uh, and, like Brad, Brad's work. Yeah, it's a good example. But even, like, even people who can use, you know, uh, like, Blur uh, filters and like a lot of those Photoshop tools, to like great effect. I love that shit. I can't. I don't really like it in my own work because I do. I, I guess it's just I. <coughs> either is that I don't really do that sort of work, uh, or that I don't really find that it sort of suits the fantasy stuff that I tend to do. But that is another sort of cool thing that to try and understand the blur. So I noticed, uh, like, the brush you're using, do you, do you typically, like, work with just, like, one primary brush for the most part, or do you... Do yeah, you I've, I've kind of just sort of landed on this one. It's a, it's the, it's not the basic, it's a, it's a chalk brush that I stole from someone's, uh, I guess, if you recognize that shape. Yeah, I have that same chalk brush just, like, chilling around. I've seen a bunch of people use it. Yeah, I don't remember whose, and I'm sorry about that, I probably shouldn't remember, but I don't remember whose brush that I stole that from, but it has definitely become my my probably favorite brush. But then I try and change it up from time to time and like try and learn new stuff. Like I, I just got a new brush set today, like I stole it from or I actually was given it by Laura Lawson at work. Uh, so I'm gonna start like fucking around with that and see if I can find some new cool brushes. Get some new Have you tried uh, making, like tried making any brushes or? Uh well I manipulate brushes. I will take brushes that I find in other people's brush sets and sort of Apply them and see what I can get out of them, and, and like, oh, that's a cool effect. Maybe I could do this and this and this. But then I'll spend like a good afternoon just screwing around with the brush. But making them from the, I've never, I, I think I've, I tried doing it once. Yeah, like I did once. I made a, I made a chainmail brush, and then I immediately regretted doing that because <laughs> <laughs> it, like, it's one of those things. Like chainmail is a, I hesitate to use the word bitch, but it is a bitch to paint. It is, it's a completely repetitive pattern. Uh, and it's not the most in, uh, like fun thing to paint in the world, but I guarantee you, if you take the time and you learn how to how chainmails hang on uh, hang on the body and um, and you know like and you paint that stuff out, it'll make all the difference. It will actually add like a lot to your character if 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 you want them to be wearing chainmail in the first place. Like it's a lot of that stuff. I, I think you would personalize each one, so it would probably feel more realistic, like it's not just like a cloned, you know, literally cloned every chain link, you know? Yeah, we're yeah. all symmetrical. And it's, it's that thing of like, going back to my hero, Paul Bonner, like he, I mean, if he can do it with with with, uh, with watercolors, then God damn it, I can do it in digital. It's not that big of an investment. And again, it's about effective mark making. So if I can trick the eye into reading it as a detail, even if it's just noise, then that's, you know, all the more power to my art, you know? Definitely. Yeah, I love the, I just love the texture of that brush, like, so, like that's my favorite thing, is, like, have, like, a little bit of, like, a painterly quality in it, like, it's something I'm trying to, try to get now. Yeah. Next result. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you that's should actually, You should actually have that, Cole. Oh, is it, <laughs> you think it is in Dave's brushes? It is. Oh, that's probably why I got it in that case. Yeah, yeah, that's a... I'm going to hunt that one down and play with it. <laughs> like, I have a pretty good one. Like, I use this square textured one. It has a similar effect, but uh, I, I've, I've always wanted, like, a good chalk brush, but, like, all the ones I get are, like, kind of, like, the standard ones. So, like, I, I just hadn't found, like, a good one. But, yeah, I might get that world. Yeah, there's a, it's also just, like, you know, you, you can probably make this kind of brush out of any slightly textured chalk brush. You just have to sort of screw around with the settings it. enough. And then you have to use enough to get comfortable with with like how much pressure you have to put to get the right result. That's kind of the trick of it too. Like it's one thing is making a good tool. The second thing is like trying to 
to get the grab to get the grips with that tool. Definitely. So at this point, I would probably like add another multiply layer and go in and just like pop out the the darkest darks, and then I would uh, slap a normal layer on top of that and just start painting the stuff out. Sort of as like a refinement pass, basically. Yeah, like you know, to to cheat it a little bit, I would. Like if if I if I had to if I had to present this to say a client now and in, in the ten next ten minutes I'll slap a screen layer on top and just make like a really cursory uh, to the edge like rim light <clears throat> try and just pop out a little bit of shape and then this is a little bit cheaty but it works it is a very good little trick to just make it look a lot more finished than it is so you can get your clip. Because a lot of clients won't really understand or know the, the process of like, you know, you, you make your thumbnails, you go make your rough sketches, then you go make your detail sketches. So they will ask you, like, you know, uh, if you deliver them thumbnails, they'll be like, ah, there is going to be more detail on this, right? You know, like, you'll, you'll get these questions. Uh, yeah, they just look like the, the finish, you know, the idea. Yeah, exactly. So. This is a good way of essentially making the client read more into your stuff than you have been able to do at that time. So whereas it is a little cheaty, you know, you can this this is a small time investment to not let the client um, <laughs> ruin your day essentially, and then you can go back and you can take this off and then you can sort of uh, yeah. 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 But this is how I also like apply. Uh, Rim lights and edge lights usually. It's I use a screen layer because it, it does if you use sort of a mid high color, then it'll blend just enough for it not to look too flat and still sort of adds like a nice slightly disopaque finish to it. And then on top of that I'll add another layer, which is not you'll see that, that this is not uh, masked on top of that silhouette. And I'll use the color dodge just to add that like glow. A little bit, not overly much, just just slightly, just enough to, to get the idea across. Yeah. Exactly. And you can also do this to you know if you find you you gone a little too dark, for example, in like the crevices of skin, because it's the it's the interesting thing about skin is that you find, actually you find the most things not just skin, but that you can do color and. Um, like color contrast and and um, saturation contrast will often get you as far and add more interest than value contrast. So if you, for example, go here and like add a more <coughs> saturated color rather than having a very great value contrast, and suddenly that can add a lot more interest to your piece rather than just like having it go real dark. Yeah, that energy like pop just a, a bit more. Yeah, definitely. It, like it, it almost like emphasizes that like plane that's down there to, you know, separates it into you know you can really kind of feel how the jaw is kind of jutting out. Yeah, definitely. And it's yeah, it's just another way of of uh, of thinking or playing with contrast, because you know like we, especially if you come from drawing, and I definitely come from drawing rather than painting. So this is like. This is getting like touching into new territory, where you have to think about contrast in other ways than just value. That's fun. <clears throat> it's a fun way to keep the the challenge new and fresh. <laughs> I really like the effect you have going on, man. So solid, really cool work. But yeah, I think that's that's pretty much the demos. Awesome. Yeah, we we really appreciate you, you know, giving us the full deal like that. That was amazing. Thank you so much. My yeah, pleasure. Really awesome stuff. Thanks for having me on. Can't wait to, to hear more editions of the uh, of the podcast. I guess it's a podcast or is it like a well what I guess, whatever uh, you interview <laughs> art talk. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, art talk there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, and you're 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 our first too, so you, you kicked it off. You know. Booyah. Yeah. Thank you. It's uh, it's been amazing. Um, yeah, yeah thank you so much for coming thing. on. Definitely go check out his work. You know, at a, was there was there something we were gonna plug? Uh, I feel like there was. Uh, oh. Just pick up the Imagine Effects. Yeah. Yeah. Pick up Imagine Effects. 
you know, and that, uh, yeah, his work is featured on the cover of it, and go over to his Facebook page. It's uh, just if you just search even Amel Amun Amunson, you know, you can yeah. find it. Um, uh, that's that's about it. Yeah, even thanks so much for coming on, man. That was really awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks, everyone, and we'll uh, we'll see you next time. Sounds